7.28 p.m. here in Seoul, South Korea. It's time for our Thursday's Meet at Korea. And joining us in the studio, Professor John DeMoya from Seoul National University. Professor DeMoya, hello to you. Good evening. Thanks very much for having me. It's off-season for us now. Uh, you want to yes. hear something? You want to hear something really funny? Go ahead. Uh, you know, the Knicks lost Game 7 to um, the Pacers. I, I'm aware. I ordered four Knicks jerseys. You know how they have, like, now different color, like, city? Yeah, sure, sure, like, sure, sure, sure. Ordered four Knicks jerseys, right? They arrive for Game 7. Oh, uh, wow. Sorry. It's the end of the playoffs. <laughs> um, as a Philadelphian who is well familiar with annual disappointments, I sympathize in multiple sports. At, at least I have the uh, New York Rangers right now. I don't know if you're a Flyers fan. But, um, uh, that's another series of disappointments I'll choose not to re revisit. There you go. <laughs> uh, we're going to talk about a very important aspect of the May 18th, 1980 Gwangju uh, democratization movement uh, that led to, unfortunately, the death of many yes. uh, innocent civilian lives, uh, all the chaos that was going on. But an aspect that isn't talked about too much uh, when we talk about this particular uh, dark history, uh, dark Korean history, it's all the journalists uh, who got involved to risk their lives, really. Yes. Um, in fact, uh, undertaking great danger to get source materials out. Yeah, ac absolutely. And so it was... Tough number one for the Korean media outlets, obviously. Yeah. But there were a number of foreign media outlets, uh, reporters who were in Korea at the time. Yes. Uh, and got out all the footages and things like that and let the world know what was going on. But I want to ask you, because we know about um, what happened on May 18th, 1980 mm -hmm. in Gwangju. But what preceded these events, and how does the city of Gwangju hold this special relationship to Korean politics? Is it just based on the fact that, well, this movement happened in Gwangju? Yeah, it's Gwangju 80, but to give you a quicker, shorter version that historians like to do, Gwangju has a long history of um, not just pushing back against the South Korean government in the early 80s, but uh, there was a uh, sort of a mini pushback, uh, I believe a kind of a student incident against the Japanese in 29 that's very famous. Obviously, if you, if you want to push back to late Chosun and some of the uprisings then, the Chola province and Gwangju in particular have a healthy history of resisting any number of different governments mm -hmm. so that the 1980 incident is very famous and obviously the South Korean history but it is in many ways sort of like the culmination of a longer history of uh, social movements uh, pushing back against Seoul regardless of who is in power. Right. Um, yeah, so, so it's a kind of like a special um, incident and in a longer history of such incidents. Because you and I both uh, live in Korea now and uh, we've heard about uh, everything that happened uh, on uh, May 18th, 1980, mm. although, it, you know, Know, there was many days leading up to the actual day when I mean May 18th is kind of the day when you know, really all hell broke loose and, yeah, uh, and then roughly happened. the next 10 days are when things go bad there's a brief period in between when the people sort of take over roughly the 22nd to the 25th mm -hmm. and then the government come back and, and the 26th and the 27th are again very dark yeah exactly and so we specifically talk about all of this and we know how it's interpreted by Koreans it's it's a even a bipartisan thing, almost, or I, yeah. I'll put an asterisk on that, uh, but because not, I wouldn't say 100%, um, but for our listeners out there uh, who are tuning in from many different parts of the world, let's talk about how this event is interpreted by Koreans just generally. Sure. Overall. I think generally, although I'll bring in the binary as well, um, the term Korea, uh, Kwangju uprising represents the more contemporary narrative, which represents the people rising up against the police and the Chung Duan forces. Uh, uh, yeah. But the opposite side of that, as the government originally portrayed it, and as I suppose some on the right still do, was the Kwangju riot, a disorganized group of local people, possibly left inspired, who were clearly not doing what they should have been doing. And again, I think that's probably in the minority now today, certainly among historians, yes. but it's still out there. Um, and even the term uprising, right? Yeah, that, that itself even might, that, yeah, yeah, right? even that like, might upset some so people. So you could have even more progressive people who would say, well... Exactly. You, uh, democracy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you did sure. a, actually a very good job using, uh, actually describing what uprising means. Sure. But still, because it's such a sensitive issue yeah. that even uprising is different, and so I've chosen to use democratization movement. That also uh, is also out there. But yeah. I've seen even 
Uh, you know, others used the word uprising without having to cause a lot of uh, controversy. It's not a very mm-hmm. controversial. The only controversial term was the riot part, right. which the government at the time was pushing at. And right. basically, you know, they had a full on control of the media. At the, well, the South, the South, the South Korean, Korean media. media. And it was being portrayed as a riot. And these people in Gwangju, where they're going against their anti-government. And, uh, and if you push it really far, um, not just that they were anti-government, but possibly that they were North Korea-inspired uh, communists, and that possibly North Korea was orchestrating their movements. Yeah, yeah, I absolutely. mean, if you go to the extreme. And which is why, even till this day, we, we go back back and forth on this, uh, that uh, if you have any progressive thoughts, or if you are anything against maybe a conservative co- government, you're, they use the term communist, right, against you. And that's sure, sure. still happens nowadays. This has been portrayed over and over again. Uh, last week, to mark the May 18th democratization movement and our, our film segment, that we talked about the many famous uh, films that have portrayed this particular issue, uh, particular incident. But we want to delve into now, really, mm-hmm. the underspoken, undercovered, uh, not, uh, not so co- uh, covered, not so much, is the journalist. Sure. Who I, but I think uh, Taxi Driver yes. was, was a very good example. Uh, of, did a nice example of showing the local people, the uh, sort of the un- history from below kind of perspective. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah and yeah, also yeah. the foreign yeah. uh, journalists who did their part in knowing what their job is, what their responsibility is as a journalist mm-hmm. to shed light on what was really happening in Gwangju. The first person we want to talk about, ladies and gentlemen, um, I think is very important because he passed away. Yes. Not too long ago. Correct, correct. Uh, Terry Anderson. Yes. Uh, he was with Associated Press. I was going to say, I wasn't sure whether it was AP or UPI, but one of the major organizations. Yeah, it was AP. I remember I, reading okay. his, Yeah, I remember and reading I believe the... based out of Japan, which is why he was able to get here quickly. I want to... Let's delve into how he reported uh, what went on in Guangzhou. Sure. Um, he is here sent after the initial incident. He, I believe he's coming over from Tokyo, and he's here from the 22nd to the 27th. So he captures the nice uh, transition from the initial violence to the period of sort of calmness to obviously the subsequent violence. And in what I've read of Anderson's accounts, he is very much, and this goes to your point about the divide, interested in trying to document uh, the sheer number of bodies he was seeing, trying to make some rough estimates and get some accurate views of how many people were actually injured and ultimately where it's important for this story is his view was much closer to the higher numbers that democracy advocates yeah. would he, he very much brought into question in a legitimate way the government's initial account which was something like 150 160 bodies which the higher estimates go up to the low 2000s i've seen higher than that but the government was definitely saying oh 150 175 and that's it yeah and, and, and the anderson was like no 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 i'm seeing hospital he was going to all the hospitals and all the yeah and when I was reading up on uh, Terry Anderson and uh, unfortunately the the report of his passing, mm-hmm. uh, most because mo- he he's actually more famous for something else. Yeah, he's yes. actually very famous. Yes, uh, and uh, even outside of this whole coverage on Gwangju, he is a very very famous. He went on to have an extremely whole second, much more famous career. Yes, yes, and, and again for a dark reason, very dark reason. And so I noticed that a lot of both. Because of his, again, his uh, fame as a journalist, both the Western media were covering his death and the Korean media were covering his death. Obviously, the Korean media was covering on his the importance of him covering the truth at yeah, yeah, yeah. Hangzhou, whereas the Western media was talking about him because he, he was a prisoner of war, basically. Yeah, uh, Hezbollah had him for a long time. <laughs> yeah, and he yeah. has a book on that. and. I noticed and that... that's probably how he's best known in America, to be honest. Oh, absolutely, yeah, because yeah. all the uh, articles on Terry Anderson was only on that. When, and I thought it was a shame no, no, no. that they in didn't prepar- talk about it. In preparing for today, I had to notice that there were very few references to his time in Korea. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. And, and that was the unfortunate thing, because for us, and I, I can understand he is known for that very big issue where his life was actually... And then, and then actually surviving and getting out of it, ultimately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and he, he has, a, I believe he has a book uh, on all the things that he's dealt with and stuff like that. But, I mean, his role in Gwangju was so big. Yeah. Right? Uh, I said, I understand in particular in terms of at least doing a, a put it crudely, a head count and kind of looking at like, here's what I'm hearing from the government. Let me verify this and very quickly saying eh, no. And again, this lends 
historians would attest, this lends much more credence to what then democracy activists now historians would say is a much more not not I'm going to be careful not a hundred percent truthful account but much more likely account because again eyewitnesses like Anderson yeah exactly and so I I, I just thought it was a little bit of a shame that the the Western media outlets weren't covering. Uh, the the Kwangju, his coverage sure, on sure, Kwangju, sure, sure. that, that really again he was one of the very few uh, foreign journalists who really uh, you know th- and, t- took out their and report. Just, just to emphasize light. as you pointed out, if he gets here the twenty second, he has to know what he's walking into. So he's he's a man who's been exposed to violence previously. Uh, he will later again be exposed to violence, but he has to kind of be going in, going like, yeah, I got to be careful here. By the way, he also fought in the Vietnam War. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. This is a man who regularly <laughs> took chances with his life and lived until his seventies. Yeah, and uh, he's he he is he's not afraid of anything. No. I think he's he's really got himself at the heart of all the conflicts that were going on. Uh, it's just that, like we said, uh, you know, he's more known for what was going on in Iran and stuff like that. But exactly. in Kwangju, the name that Koreans are more familiar with is Jürgen Hinspeter. Um, let's talk about why he became especially famous for his Kwangju coverage. Yeah, he, like Anderson, is, I believe, based in Japan. And then he comes the 20th, apparently gets footage, goes back uh, to Tokyo, and then comes back again on the 23rd, recognizing the importance. But I think the most, and I guess, because this is how I learned it too, if you ever see any still images, and in particular video footage, which is the actually the only video footage from Western media, for Kwanju, that's him. Yeah. So he, uh, I've, 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 as far as I understand it, basically like hides his film canisters and his video equipment in somewhere in his clothing because he's walking in knowing leaving going back to Tokyo and then coming back a second time that anyone affiliated with the Korean government as you said under Chun Doo-wan and media control is at the very least going to take his materials more likely throw him into a prison and more likely kill him yeah and so the and he's mo- just like I'm, yeah, I'm going to do this <laughs> oh absolutely and which is why the movie is called Taxi Driver because it's the taxi driver that helped him I kind of figured something like that yeah, who's come out of right, Gwangju right right right, right. He, uh, had to, he had to have a help and people who kind of quietly yeah yeah exactly and i think this is the thing right I, you know there are many different journalists out there um unfortunately there are many journalists out there who are you know, kind of do the clickbait kind of stuff you know the sure use of stuff that a little you know, bit from remote and yeah it's stuff that we shouldn't be reading about but this is a person who took pride great pride in his job Okay, he knew what the response of his responsibility as a journalist is to let the world know what was going on to I, I wouldn't go as far as to say maybe like risk his life per se. I, I, I would assume that if the government at the time did terrible things to Jürgen Hinspeter, that there would have been some terrible repercussions uh, that um, would he follow. Was, yeah, he was a West German citizen, so you would think that that might give him, right, a li- like Anderson, an American, a little bit of leeway. But still, at the very least, yes. they would have taken his materials and beaten him. Yeah, exactly. And said, no, he doesn't know what he's talking about. He just, yeah. he was, you know, got a left-wing journalist or something. Communist, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Things like that, and, yeah. and things might have turned out a little bit different yeah. in history, and we might not. And, have... And we would not have any footage of the little footage that I've seen is, of course, is people with batons beating students and citizens. Yeah, exactly. And that's exactly his 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 footage. And that is the lone footage that yep. comes out. And yep. uh, every time around, uh, you know, unfortunately, Jürgen Hinspeter is not uh, with us anymore, and uh, his, I believe, son, I believe, uh, recently accepted an award yeah if i can just tack on to that too apparently i mean it's a nice story and there are i believe with in somewhere in kwangju there is a either a statue or some sort of memorial to him but in the accounts i was reading he actually was so affected by korea and came back and he was also in the later 80s uh, yeah, yeah. In, involved that he actually had asked upon death to be buried in korea which his family did not follow right right but nonetheless he is greatly respected um both in his home country and in korea people clearly recognize the contribution he made to essentially um um, democ- the 80s democratization movement. Is there... I'm, I'm looking at this question right mm-hmm. now. Uh, Anderson and Hinspeter, uh, they have something in common in terms of their backgrounds? Yeah, just in... I mean, again, a broad pattern that historians think of. Um, Anderson fights in Vietnam. I believe Hinspeter covers Vietnam. They're both coming out of Tokyo, different media traditions. But so that kind of larger Western tradition of being in Asia of, of post-45 and um, having been previously exposed to violence, if Hinspeter doesn't quite as far as Anderson go to even more risks. He does, I believe, get injured in 86 and 87 during coverage. So they both dedicate themselves to kind of um, the outsider 
you know, coming out of Tokyo media, but I'm very much willing to sacrifice their personal uh, circumstances for lack of a better word, trying to capture as accurately as possible accounts on the ground, photographs on the ground. What was after these reports? So you have the AP report by the late uh, Terry Anderson. You have the video footages by the late um, Jürgen uh, Henspeter that went out that uh, everyone has seen now uh, all over the world. What was the international media response in general in what was going on in Gwangju thanks to these reports? Yeah, I think it not immediately because of course there, you, there's you know it takes time for these it's, things it's different it's a yeah. different time back but then I, yeah. but i think slowly it pushes back against the government narrative particularly the video footage from uh the, the german side where people begin to realize at the very least they might do the government report and say but there have been some contradictory reports and then and obviously over time uh it has now emerged obviously where um at least historians all but the hardcore favoring the Korean right would favor more of an account of probably a higher body count, um, probably obviously a much more complex situation on the ground that we do now recognize that uh, the Kwangju people um, had a legitimate set of reasons for pushing back and that's the earlier controversy about you know the vocabulary. So the the consensus is that the reason why the coverage being made by a foreign media outlet is so significant is because the general idea is that you would get a very unbiased report. Precisely, right? or, or at least or at least if not completely unbiased, certainly they had no immediate agenda in quite the same visible way as the Korean government had. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And so like, there are certain major news agencies, you know, we talk about Reuters, uh, you talk about uh, AP, uh, you could talk about AFP and then uh, is it RP, RPI? Was it UPI? UPI is the other one, I believe. Yeah, I'm, I've lost when I was younger. I've lost track in the net age, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Press International. Yeah, there's a number of them, and we generally like to say that there are the unbiased kind of the international media outlets, and so the coverage being made is there's no in, influence by you know any government or things like that. Uh, you, you know, it's it's not. Fox News, let's say, for instance, where it leans, okay, nah, it leans a yeah, certain we're in, way. We're in a different era today. Yeah, where, yeah. where it leans a certain way, right? And which is why for many uh, journalists who look at uh, foreign news, what, what we call foreign news, we generally look at those presses, right? Uh, Reuters and AP and, uh, you know, AFP and things like that. Um, the two men that we just talked about here, mm -hmm. again, uh, it did not end with Gwangju. No. <laughs> many things have happened since then. But I want to kind of ask you how Gwangju affected their work and lives. I know with Terry Anderson, sure. it was just on a next level. Uh, but what about the Jürgen Hinspeter? Yeah, uh, he definitely uh, personally has set, had said that he was deeply affected by Korea. He clearly came back. And again, I said he was, I believe, heavily involved in 86, 87 coverage coming into the moment of, you know, the culmination of the democracy movement. I believe he gets injured. And again, I don't know how much he continued to come back on and off, but he, uh, the, the the pledge that he made to asking to be buried here, although that did not happen. Yes. The fact that there is, I think, and I said, I think it's in Kwangju where there's some sort of memorial oh, yeah, marking absolutely. his point. Yeah. So he clearly basically spent the rest of his life while doing a press career uh, in a dialogue with the Korean experience and how it, it continued to inform his journalistic practice. I think if you go down to Gwangju, uh, there is a... I don't want to go... It might be a, it might be at the museum. I was uh, just saying, cool, I'm not sure which site, but yeah. Yeah, um, and that was... It's run by the, the Ministry of Culture, Sports, and Tourism, and I, I believe... Uh, you can actually, number one, see the footages by uh, sure. Jürgen uh, Henspeter, but also you can read the actual articles. Okay, uh, that at were the time, by, that, that is actually kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah uh, by Terry Anderson. And so you can kind of see what kind of uh, uh, stories that are going out into this. You are a professor, mm -hmm. uh, you know, not a journalist per se, so you, you could kind of give us a, a very unbiased take on uh, this. What is, <laughs> what is... Uh, the role of a journalist oh, wow, in this okay. day of era right now because there are so many things that are happening uh, around the world and yeah. there are so many coverages on Korea because now you mean 1980 or you mean no, no, now, 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 now. Um, I think the journalist role is still arguably one of trying to capture the information it's just that the organizations in which they embedded are far more powerful. You can get things across the net much faster than you could with transmitting by wire back in 1980. Yeah. So that they are, if even if they're trying to do their jobs legitimately, and I hope they are, they're in a set of they're embedded in a set of forces that is very different, and it's much harder for them to control what 
goes out from their images and messages and they may find that they send out an image and it gets embedded in a very different story yeah that i think was less of a far less of a problem in 1980 where uh if they captioned it a certain way probably their organization unless there was a massive error would say okay that's that's how it's going out yeah so yeah i, I would still credit them I, it's the me forces that are beyond their control the internet massive social media things like this have made it much more difficult yeah and uh, unfortunately you know in this era 2024 you would think that uh, maybe there is more freedom of press uh, however there are certain countries uh, and uh, in certain years where freedom of press is i would say deprived uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, and even in the states you have to be careful um i would imagine i mean it's not right it's no longer baseline assumption of certain co it, it's more complicated in almost every co media climate yeah and uh then we uh, specifically uh kind of uh, made sure that we covered this aspect of uh, the Gwangju democratization movement, uh, these uh, two uh, foreign media journalists uh, who really have shed light on what was really going on in Gwangju at the time to the rest of the world. Professor Demoya, thank you very much for your lessons today. Have a safe rest of your week, and uh, we'll see you again next week. Thanks very much. You can listen to Korea Now with me, SJ Lee, by downloading the Arirang Radio application or tune in online by visiting www.arirangradio.com. So make sure you tune in Mondays through Fridays, 6 p.m. to 8 p.m. Korea time.